Welcome to Pineland Underground, the official podcast of the United States Army's John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School, and the best podcast the military has to offer. Real, bold, and unrestricted. We're your hosts, Sergeant Major Chuck Ritter, Major Bobby Tuttle. Welcome to Pineland Underground. Welcome back to Pineland Underground. Chuck and I are here. We're excited to record a great episode today, and we're sitting down talking about the theme of psychological operations, or what we call in the Army Special Operations, PSYOP. You have your three tribes. You have civil affairs, psychological operations, and special forces, and we're dedicating this entire episode to psychological operations. We're going to talk about the history, what psychological operations is uh, throughout history, some philosophy, some historical vignettes, and I'd like to introduce our awesome rock star guests, uh, two major coming from 5th Battalion, 1st Special Warfare Training Group. I have the current operations officer, Major Ashley Holtzman. Ash, happy to have you on the show today, man. It's good to be here. And I've got the current Bravo Company commander, uh, Will Lamb. Will, happy to have you here too, man. Hey now, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, so you guys, you guys actually just... You guys actually just uh, changed command, correct? So you guys each just had each other's positions, or I just the left the position that Will is in. And correct. Now Will. The unfortunate position of following in Ash's uh, wake. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we'll see. I think he'll do great. <laughs> and then Will, uh, where are you coming from before you took command? So I'm coming from Fourth Sab Group's outreach team, uh, which is kind of a, a weird hybrid of uh, public affairs, recruiting, uh, and branding for the branch. Love it. Yeah. Hey, what we're also going to talk about is this video going around the ghost in the machine which has caused a lot of controversy online uh, we have some people in the room that that were involved in that so i'm interested in, in discussing that as well yeah incredibly interested it yeah. ghost in the machine if you haven't checked it out check it out on youtube but we're going to talk a lot about that today yeah. all right chuck over to you man all right so in our last podcast we talked about civil affairs and we we defined what civil affairs is in within the army special operations what we define as civil affairs, PSYOP, and special forces, understanding that we have special mission units and ranger regiment, but we're not including that in our current definition within the Special Warfare Center in school. So over to you, Ash. Let's talk about psychological operations and what it is, and then we'll talk about where it came from. Yes. So the way I define it to a student or even a layman is at, at its basic core, PSYOP is the insertion of information into the environment to achieve an effect. Often we target audiences, but sometimes it's individuals. We can't target Americans. Uh, and when we're talking about the way we do it, we're using either high-tech, low-tech, or, or what we call no-tech means. So it can be a conversation face-to-face. It could be a tweet. Uh, we'll tell you some stories. It could be a dead body. It could be anything. Anything is considered information when applied correctly. We often are in all sorts of spectrums of operation. So we'll be involved in humanitarian responses, but we're also doing what we call military information support operations, usually by, with, and through uh, partner nations and with embassies involved where we're working with our State Department counterparts or interagency counterparts. But then we also have war, and we call that psychological warfare now, psi war. And that's when a lot of the the constraints are off because we're in a combat environment. The military is the landowner, and we have capability where there's a lot more stuff going on and then we also have military deception a lot of people when they when they think of psyop they think of military deception the spooky stuff the things that are not fun but they're more challenging and so because the problems are more challenging your solutions are more out there I think this is incredibly important. As you look at our current environment right now so uh, really in competition and integrated deterrence are kind of the key terms that we're looking at across uh, the way to approach the is national Is that still the new term? Strategy. We haven't changed it yet? It's integrated deterrence. Uh, still. Still. Okay. I think so. For the next week. <laughs> but inf- the information environment spreads across before, during, and after. It's completely cyclical. It's involved in every single thing that we should be thinking about, uh, planning, and every way we apply our military, but also the State Department as well, and our other entities within the dime construct. So just kind of want to hit on how important that is. And what, then, is what is PSYOP not, though? What were you going to say, Chuck? I wanted Ash to walk us through the bullseye analogy and the spear analogy. Oh, yeah. So yeah, right before that. the episode, we were kind of talking about. So in as an example, the Ghost in the Machine video, there's a line where uh, the creators of the video claim that we're, you see us at 
uh, at the tip of the spear. And we saw some responses from some direct action guys that said that's their quote. Unfortunately, uh, car companies you say they're the tip of the spear. Uh, transportation as an entire field in the military says it's the tip of the spear. Uh, so like, it's not just their, their quote. Uh, and where the quote actually is derived from is a quote from Wild Bill Donovan when he was founding the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which eventually became the CIA, Special Forces, and Psy War after World War II. So that's where that, that's a lot of our lineage comes from that organization. Oh, yeah. And he said that the tip of the spear was information. The way he wanted his model of special operations to exist was you first put information into the environment. Then after that, you put special forces into the environment. That wasn't what modern special forces is considered. That's just the phrase they used. But it is basically what special forces evolved into. And then after that, you then insert your conventional forces. You should have those two things precede it. And if we're talking about the modern way that we apply SOF, uh, I would equate that in the kind of the way the conversation went before the podcast is the bullseye itself is kind of what CA is doing. Civil affairs is creating conditions prior to the spear even being thrown. And then the c- civil affairs is also kind of like the shaft of the spear where they're, they're all of the stuff that's occurring afterwards as well. So if you look at the model of special operations, you're doing PSYOP all the time in forever in the whole course of everything. But you're doing different kinds of PSYOP. You're doing different things when you're below the threshold of war. You're doing different things in peacetime, working with partners, preparing them. But then uh, you're also looking at what CA does, which is prep up front and prep at the back. And they're also doing stuff in between as well. Ash is uh, such a uh, impressive order. It's kind of hard to top that. Um, You're just calling me a nerd. That's what you're saying. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's that's how we got him on the show. People reaching out and say, hey, this guy is so nerdy into PSYOP history that you need to get this guy on the show to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, it, they, they actually used our Gmail account. They did, you, well, yeah, well, yeah. Pine Not Underground. Not just you, other people. It's very I mean, rare. Yeah. <laughs> very rare. So, the, the truth is most of us are nerds uh, in, in some capacity or another, right? Um, there's this, um, when we look at, you know, who who is a PSYOPer, right? Um, we are uh, not just soldiers, but we're writers, we're thinkers, uh, we're filmmakers, um, all of these things, and I think that's why the, the Ghost Army, right? In terms of when you talk about identity and brand, that's why that Ghost Army is so um, uh, it resonates uh, with with the regiment, with the modern um, psyoper. Right, absolutely, right. Because you took a bunch of um, you know, you took a bunch of artisans, right, from the United States in the the 40s during World War II, uh, and you uh, put them together and said, hey, you know, we need to d- deceive the Germans. Uh, to create effects and, and and make it easier for uh, for our combined forces and um, yeah so it's, it's super neat to be part of that spiritual lineage um, and is uh, something that that inspires us uh, on the daily at the assessment and selection for psychological operations here at the John F Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School what are some of those traits or what's kind of the characterizations or the attributes that uh, PSYOP is looking for to hire on or to, to select people to come into the regiment to try out and then train them. Right. Well, what do you think about this, Ash? Because you've been kind of in this sort of pipeline for the last year. Yeah. And you've seen you've seen sort of the – so who gets selected at selection, and they, they end up in your course. Right? Yeah. So, so I, I had a unique – so just before you go, I, I was recruiting them in the last year, right? So my job was kind of to cast this wide net. Um, but at the same time, recruit for who you want to be in your formation, right? So – what, what do you think about uh, about that? I think, so up front, I'm going to say something very disappointing to our listeners, is if there's anything we found from the data, is that there's no such thing as a perfect psyoper. Yeah. The You might have a perfect ranger, and there's a mold that you want to like find. I want to find this John Rambo character, and I know he's real. It and I'm going to bring, right? you know, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for, for, uh, for us, it, what PSYOP really is at its essence when we like, talk about the ghost army is it, it, we are the marriage of the sciences and the arts. So I do want psychology degrees and sociology degrees and anthropologists, and I want mathematicians. We have a nuclear physicist that just went through the course. Uh, it could be any of the sciences will make you good at this because you need some of that analytical ability and also some of that academia grounding. We have a lot of enlisted that have master's degrees. Uh, m- uh, like Multiple members of my teams that I've had 
had higher degrees than I had at the time when I was leading them. It's very, very common in the SIOP regiment to have a PhD on your team. It's not, it's not unheard of. And he's enlisted or she's enlisted, um, which also brings us to like gender. We've had women in SIOP since World War I. So like, as far as like looking at like the diversity of our regiment, we have a very diverse group. It's not like some of the other organizations in the military where we have a lot of people of color that make up entire battalions in our formation, where to be a white guy on some of those teams is actually kind of rare. So, uh, so there's that, but it's also the arts. So I said the sciences, it's also the marriage of the arts. Like, Will, you have a background in film. I'm a writer, and I was a graphic illustrator before I joined the Army. That's not un uncommon also. So, like, we talk about the Ghost Army where there was, like, seamstresses, like male seamstresses, and uh, people who were into fashion. Bill Bloss went on to be, like, the Tommy Hill figure of his day after the Ghost Army. He was incredibly famous. They're doing, uh, it's called 100 Days of Bloss right now where they're <laughs> celebrating his life. Hi awesome. Highlight what the Ghost Army is real quick for our audience. So the Ghost Army was a, a mobile deception unit with roughly 300 personnel. I think I'm saying that. I think the number's right. This um, is World War II? World War II. It directly worked for Eisenhower. So Eisenhower had the Office of uh, Strategic Services, but he also had other things. Uh, Office of War Information uh, and the Inc., uh, and then eventually the Ghost Army. There's a bunch of stuff that did influence back then. We kind of compartmentalized it a little. And the mobile deception unit was essentially formed out of this uh, this military deception or mill deck that was called Operation Fortitude, which we used, if you've ever seen the movie, the movie Patton, the very beginning of that movie where Patton... George C. Scott, the yeah, very beginning. Yeah. yeah, he's in front of the American flag giving the what they called the blood and gut speech. That was a mill deck where he was pretending to stand up a unit that wasn't real and that wasn't declassified to like the 90s so having that in the movie Patton, like they weren't allowed to say like listen that's not so the real. audience there was really just fake uh-huh yeah absolutely absolutely um it was all staged it was fake and he was doing this speech and he was standing up a fake unit because he had just been fired and they didn't know what to do with Patton yet but at the same time the germans thought so highly of Patton because he was so competent on the battlefield, they were convinced he would lead the invasion. He would have the main effort. Uh huh. The so main effort of the invasion. Would what be better Patton's way army. to deal with that than to just pretend like he is going to be the main effort and then also stand up all these inflatable tanks and stuff, and that's his army. That when the Germans would do their reconnaissance overhead, they would see this, yeah, Patton's got an army there, dudes. Like, there's, and there's a lot of people associate with the, the ghost army with Britain, but the reality is that army flowed into to Europe. It was, there was the Battle of the Bulge, correct? Yeah, so they were at all sorts of they were at all sorts of events. So they were at the Battle of the Bulge at some point around then. Dr. Seuss had come out to visit them. So it's getting into like the weirdness of psyop, where uh, uh, something I'll say is often if you see like a ranger who's famous, they're famous because they're a ranger, you know, or uh, not to talk crap to you guys, but like most SF guys who are famous <laughs> are famous for being SF guys, right? Uh, they're not famous on the side with something unrelated. But in PSYOP, like our history is weird where if someone's famous in PSYOP, it's because they're probably famous, like outside of what they did in PSYOP. So Dr. Seuss, Walt Disney, um, we have uh, like The Moon is Down written by Steinbeck. Yeah. Oh, John Steinbeck. Right. Steinbeck himself. <laughs> yeah. So like, like these crazy names where you're like, no way. They did PSYOP. It's like, well, yeah, they were involved in some things. And I'll tell you all sorts of stories if you want to hear them all. I won't stop talking. So, you but it was it was much more than just like inflatable stuff. These guys were doing like radio deception, making it truly mm -hmm. look like there was this massive entity that was about to come. Yeah. So once they did the Normandy invasion, they then mobilized and took all those artists that we used for that single deception and decided to make a mobile unit that they could task and send all over the battlefield. And so it did. It looked it was, like a unit. It sounded like the, uh -huh. that unit. It, it had signals replication so they mm -hmm. could be picked up by, by the Germans to yep. look and sound like that unit has moved. There was audio replication, so loudspeakers. We think, we think of those as uh, kind of a dumb old solution, but when used properly, really effective, especially when you're talking about the battles that were occurring in Europe with hedge corros and stuff where you didn't have line of sight. So if you heard a tank coming, you were pretty scared. So they did that. They would use they would use their terrain to their advantage. So audio signals uh, uh, deception, where it looked like the radio signature, and also hearing uh, audio over the radio waves, 
and they would pose. They did face-to-face deception where they would actually, they had seamstresses, right? They actually used those guys, and they would make uniforms and patches of all sorts of units, and they would go into the towns and talk loose, as they would say, and they would pretend to be other units doing all sorts of things. Um, and then, and then the inflatables was visual. They didn't look real up close, but if you're doing aerial reconnaissance, and that's how we were using uh, a lot of airplanes back then for for the periphery of the battlefield, uh, you would see these things, and it looked like they were tanks. And all they had was like a couple um, like earth movers, and they would just put those and pretend those were the tank tracks. And they'd move, make tra- tank tracks everywhere with like a bulldozer. Right. So. And ultimately, right, it's influencing decision makers, mm-hmm. right? Creating doubt and uncertainty uh, in those decisions. And that, that's ultimately what, you know, leads to some kind of effect. Um, Operation mm-hmm. Mincemeat is a huge... Just not, watch that movie. Yeah. Heck yeah. I wasn't like super into it. I, I don't know. I just watched uh, Imitation Game, right? Which is mm-hmm. a, a brilliantly sort of... Um, Made World well, War What's Mincemeat about? Because Bobby was talking to me about it like, last week. Yeah, go ahead, guys. I'll let Will. Uh, oh, I so, said. I, I, listen, I, I think I'm going like, to reveal how uh, how dusty my my history is here, right? But it, essentially, uh, the the Allies had to convince Hitler that he needed to move his divisions from I think the Balkans to Italy or the other way. Oh, uh, they were trying it? to convince him. I think that the invasion, they wanted him to believe the invasion was going to go to Greece. Right, right. So back in, you know, back in the 40s, right, you think about what does it take to move an army, right? So once that decision's made, then that's that's ultimately what they're going for, right? So what they did was they, they essentially had to, or, let's see, how does, how does this go? They, they take this body, um, they, they source this guy, they create this whole backstory for him. Um, they give him a, a life and they drop him off in the middle of the Mediterranean um, with the hope that uh, the Spanish would pick up this body and then fall into the hands of German intelligence officers who are stationed in, in Spain. So it, it was this incredible um, a domino effect they were going for. And just the amount of like care they put into creating a backstory for this guy, how yes. he was dressed, um, you know, how he actually... Uh, the pocket litter that was found on him. Exactly. The, the, the way he would have written, his, his, his like the shape he would have been in at that period of time, what it would have on him. Like, well, love it, letters, right? Yeah, from yeah. His, the, yeah. The, 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 the depth of background that uh, any German intelligence operative could go and try to figure out what the who this person really was and did he exist and have a real life. Right. And ultimately... Truly detailed. A briefcase, right, with with the plans, right? That That's the thing that has to get in front of the eyes of, of the decision maker. I watched the whole thing because it's pretty rare for there to be a movie about PSYOP, let alone a movie about deception and greatest hits, right? So for one, this was the British teams that were doing this. The British, the British did pioneer a lot of military deception. Uh, while we were also working with them, we weren't as directly connected to this one. But it is the model. Uh, it was written by Ian Fleming, the guy who created yeah. Bond. James Bond. Yeah. So as I said before, often when someone's famous in PSYOP, it's because they're famous. You know? <laughs> uh, so James Bond creator decided to make this, this concept. Uh, and it ended up working because, one, the Germans had lost the opportunity to recover a body previously that did turn out to have classified information on it. And so they were really paranoid that they were gonna lose another opportunity like that in the future. And two, the Spanish were neutral in the war, but they were kind of not neutral. So they were becoming a fascist government. It's actually uh, infamous in that it's one of the governments that had a dictator who was a fascist who died of old age. Very rare for dictators to die of old age, as they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of all those, dom- those were like pieces of the dominoes that like actually made it work and successful. The spoiler alert, uh, they fell for it, and it's estimated that roughly 30,000 lives were saved because the Nazis did change uh, and right reroute uh, enemy troops to another location. So when they did the, brunt, the, the beach landing, it was not a massive, brutal beach landing like we've seen in other, in other instances. So, oh, yes. Boom. Yeah, check it out. It just came out. I think it's uh, it's relatively new. It's on Netflix right now. And then uh, if you want to learn anything about the Ghost Army, there's a really good free documentary if you have Amazon Prime Video uh, about the Ghost Army on there. What's it called? It's called The Ghost Army. Excellent. Be. Easy title. But talking about the Ghost Army, nice. even fast forward, Desert Storm, right? Mm-hmm. Another great example of us using a very like entity when we did the, the Hail Mary 
Yeah, how we the used left loudspeakers, left. signal mm -hmm. to try to convince Saddam that we were coming through Kuwait. Yeah. Oh, man, that's fascinating because it also shows that even though we're in the modern era of warfare, sometimes uh, that low tech that we call it, like the, the loudspeakers and things like smoke. Yeah, smoke tracks going back and forth. Sometimes those are a, a valid solution. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't disc we uh, sometimes our students will come in and they'll want to only talk about high tech, Twitter, Facebook, text messaging, the Internet. That's great. But I'm operating in an African country that doesn't have access to the Internet. They're all on radios and stuff still. So, hey, maybe I can't I can't use the Internet or I'm in Afghanistan and check it out. There are a lot of Internet users in Afghanistan in the capital city of Kabul. Mm -hmm. my action is outside in the periphery. So it doesn't matter how much I put on the internet if none of, none of my audience is out on the internet. So those, those are things to consider. Yeah, not, not only do they not have technology, but a lot of them are literate. So then how do you get uh -huh. how do you get that into there? Absolutely. That's also a factor. You need to look at literacy rates. Mm -hmm. uh, or you also need to look at the enemy. ISIS uh, was beheading people for having cell phones. Check it out. No one had cell phones. Why? Because they don't want to be beheaded, man. So it doesn't matter how many tweets that you send out. Like They're not going to read your tweet. Uh, yeah. So that's when you have to start thinking about, like, all right, I need to go back to the basics. I need to go old school. That's when a leaflet actually might be the solution. Uh, that's when things like loudspeakers. So Desert Storm, we knew that uh, a few valuable pieces of information from uh, Saddam about him. One, he did not trust his own intelligence apparatus. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> two, he really trusted CNN and watched it all the time. Hell yeah. Uh, three, he was convinced that we were going to do a beach landing. So let's give him what, what he wants. So when you're doing deception and that form of PSYOP where, or influence rather, where you're, you're basically focusing on, like Will said, a decision maker. What's really cool about dictatorships is there's very few decision makers. So you kind of know who, you, who you're going to target. Uh, when you're going after like more nebulous enemy, like a terrorist group, that's kind of harder mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about deception because decision makers are all over the place that's how they're successful is there's not one single head of the snake Saddam he thought that we were coming from the ocean so we set up a whole mew we we put them out there and we invited CNN Saddam's favorite out there so you this have was, a whole marine expeditionary unit uh -huh. out there just off the coast You've, you're inviting CNN and reporters to live broadcast from these correct yep and then Schwarzkopf himself was very involved in this so this is also another important thing that we should bring up is uh, PSYOP is most successful when like basically a four-star general is very involved mm -hmm. uh, because of the way that our authorities function there is uh, at times it takes that kind of brass to really want the efforts to go forward if they are involved you'll see some of our greatest hits that's kind of where it comes back to the ghost army was kind of directly managed by Eisenhower who was a five-star general at the time so you can see that like oh man that led to the ghost army okay I can see a pattern where then you go through our history Schwarzkopf was involved he basically did an interview with CNN saying like I'm not telling you guys that we're gonna do a beach landing <laughs> However, I got all these Marines out here. World War II, we did beach landings. <laughs> Korean War, we did beach landings. Guess what America likes to do? Beach landings. And so CNN is then like, oh, we got an exclusive scoop, we think. Uh, yeah, it led to a really great Saturday Night Live sketch where all of those uh, reporters keep raising their hands asking for like the, the war plans. And then... Uh, you know, the guy kept saying, like, I can't tell you the war plans. Why you... Well, what if you told us the war plans? Um, it was basically that. <laughs> Simultaneously, when that happened, we also did uh, a massive military deception slash psyop in the South, where we had roughly 300 people personnel. That's like our magic number for some reason. Uh, where they were doing uh, signals intelligence to make it look like there was uh, a unit down there doing their thing. They wanted to look like a division. They also had uh, chemical vehicles, which we don't have these vehicles anymore. NATO does. There is vehicles in NATO, but we don't have these in our chemical core anymore, where they were just making smoke and going back and forth. And then we were doing PSYOP, where we were using loudspeakers, massive ones, massive loudspeakers, projecting the sounds of a division, just kind of hanging out, tanks starting and driving around a little, you Ma know, soldiers maintenance being soldiers. buckering down into position. Oh yeah, soldiers and, complaining. Yeah. You know the way the way that the way that we are. <laughs> Maybe throw some people. MRE trash everywhere. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> like just blasting it out. And then uh, simultaneously, what a lot of people don't uh, say 
when we talk about that part is we also uh, were friends with SPOT. I don't know what the acronym is. It's in French. Uh, it was It's a French satellite constellation that does geo-intelligence and sells it. And that's what Iraq at the time, Saddam, was using for their geospatial intelligence. Mm. So all of their imagery that could have confirmed or denied this massive pile of smoke in the south could have shown them that, hey, that's not that's a deception. Well, we we knew France and we did this thing called diplomacy and we kind of just bought out all that stuff and turned off uh, Iraq's nice. access to their geospatial intelligence. So the only thing that was left what there, was their human apparatus. And uh, so we did a few more things to insert stuff. We actually had some naval, Navy SEALs go onto the beach and like uh, do like a recon and then come back. But then Saddam's uh, intel apparatus didn't pick them up. I saw that GI Jane actually. <laughs> <laughs> it got, yeah, very similar. So we actually sent them again. Schwarzkopf was like, send them again. <laughs> do and it again. Like, we had to send the SEALs again because they did, they did a good job. And so we had to send them back and had to like stomp around, <laughs> like leave footprints and stuff and like shooting weapons and litter. Like yeah, they, like, they had to be like be, loud. Be less surreptitious. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so then that and at that that second time, then they were picked up. <laughs> so like, that was like reinforcing the beach landing thing. But then we were doing just completely overt side up there too, where we'd say, okay, you've got three Republic, Republican Guard units here. Oh, yeah. So we're going to drop a 15,000 pound bomb on this one. And at the same time, we're going to drop leaflets on these other two and say, hey, look. We're, we're about to drop a 15,000 pound bomb on this unit right here. And in a week, we're gonna drop one on you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So have fun. Yeah, you, so. You might wanna surrender. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, go over here with some white flags and surrender, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, so we had deployed 4th SAP group. The whole group went forward. And uh, our group commanders and everything were very involved. We had a full bird at the time who was in charge. Uh, and everyone, it, it was a, a all-hands-on-deck effort. So once the deception was done, and we did the left hook and we were invading, we started dropping leaflets, like you said. And this was actually a huge stink. There's <clears> actually an, um, an oral history of recordings of Schwarzkopf uh, written down. I don't know if there's the audio, but um, he basically said like, I will do this. This is my idea. He, and he, as I said, when four stars are involved, it, may, it moves everything much faster because they're the ones assuming the most risk. It's the four star uh, commanders who assume risk and say yes and no, essentially. They can delegate, but they're the ones who are saying yes and no to influence occurring. And he said, I will release, I wanna release the targeting information, which was top secret. Air Force was really not happy that he wanted to do this, but drop the leaflet saying, I'm gonna bomb you. That's a top secret yeah. release of information. I'm gonna bomb you tomorrow, unless you surrender. You can use this leaflet to surrender. And then he, they flew through, and the next day they did bomb them. So when you're talking about influence and kinetic action, as we say, you do need to follow through on your threat. If you have a threat, it only works if they believe you. Mm. So you have to bomb them. Then the next day, the unit right next to it, drop a leaflet. We're going to bomb you tomorrow too. Yeah. Uh, magically. Uh, that really works, and so there's uh, there was a guy named Jack Sumi who was in that that era's version of the Kayak. I don't know what mm -hmm. the Kayak is. It's basically the Air Force, like the, the the giant operations center, like you've seen in all the recruiting videos. With oh, those yeah. fancy it was in Transformers too. In, yes. every, yes. in every movie, it's, the really, it's always bigger. dark. Yeah, and they somehow on a one fifty two talking three hundred miles away. I don't yeah, know. there's like projectors on all the walls. Yeah, the whole wall is just projector screens, and every time there's a thing, they say air power all the time. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> Jack Sumi was in there as the PSYOP planner for the leaflets that was coordinating with the Air Force. And he was made fun of every day because, of course, he would be, right? The, the sure. PSYOP guy is like, we're going to drop leaflets. It's going to work, you guys. It, it sounds silly. It kind of is silly. We admit it. But uh, the day he came in after the first strike had happened, well, all of a sudden Iraqis, by the thousands, like thousands of Iraqis, not like 400, not 100, not 10, Thousands of Iraqi soldiers were coming uh, and surrendering, and it was this massive movement of people, and they were all holding the leaflets in their hands, saying they surrender, hands up. It was, it's what we call the unicorn movement moment, where you don't see it. You don't ever see your operations be so effective that they're holding your product in their hands, saying, like, please let me surrender to you. So when Jack Sumi came into work that day, he was greeted with a standing ovation. Like, it was just like this magical 
magical moment yeah. in our history. That's ah, very cool. It works. Right? It works. Yeah. But Measures can, of effect. You can <laughs> apply this stuff back here. So I used to, one of the officers I used to work with, I would leave a note on his desk saying, I'm, I'm going to take the front wheel off of your <laughs> roller chair tomorrow. There's nothing you can do about it. Sure enough, I would do it and fall over. And then after about a week of that, everybody was so paranoid that they would come in. That's the first thing they do. It would, it would change their behavior to where they would check the wheels of all their chairs in the, in the team room, right? Just, that's called building camaraderie. It's just basic, yeah. basic psyop, right? Office pranks are the greatest psyop. So. They are. In fact, uh, there's a cricket somewhere <laughs> under my desk. And it, for a while, I was like, there's a cricket in here. I just I accepted it, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, this cat started meowing. <laughs> and, and my... You know, my DJ alter ego is DJ Cat Daddy, and I got three cats. So, like, <laughs> they did the target audience analysis on me and hid this, like, cat in my office somewhere, and I can't, still can't find it. Like, it cries out in your current what? job. But current, yeah, like, right now in my there's, office. There's, there's no a worse cat. place to be when you're talking about office shenanigans than in the room with a psy opera that has a little extra free time. Oh, yeah. But hold on. I'm definitely interested. So, like, what is the uh, desired effect on you? At, rather than agitation, like, how are they trying to influence your behavior I, you know, or your, I, the way you approach coming into the room every so day? So I think it's a stressor. It is. They're so probably I, trying to get you this to This cat like, say sounds like it's in – yeah, they want me to, like, where is this cat at? So you have to ignore it now. Act like it I, well, unfortunately, that yesterday, my first sergeant was next door, and he probably heard me going through the roof trying to find where this <laughs> cat was at because it seems to be coming from everywhere. But um, <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, the office is empty today, so uh, I had some, some time to go look for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've hit on a couple of vignettes here. We've talked about what PSYOP is. I want to ask you guys about the philosophy of psychological operations. Okay. How, yeah. how do you guys, how do you think about that? How do you advise a commander? Um, just get, get, let loose on a little bit of that information. Uh, in order to understand PSYOP and why it exists, you have to go back to the beginning and, and look at, like, democracies. So the reason propaganda was stood up was initially uh, – because churches wanted to propagate the faith. That's where the word propaganda comes from. Propagate. The, the like Catholic that. Church. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, this uh, is a great intro. I'm <laughs> taking it's a, notes. It, it's from a Latin. It's from, there's a Latin root, root phrase that is the propagation of the faith. And that, that's that. Fa fast forward. And it didn't take off truly until democracies. So you look at like the French Revolution, the American Revolution where the people started rising up and defining what they believed their version of government should be, which is they need a level of interaction. So post that, uh, governments did start allowing the people to be represented and to represent themselves. And that meant that the people kind of can tell you no. So you, you didn't have these uh, dictatorships and these uh, Monarchy, monarchies and everything like as prevalent as before. So then governments had to start convincing their populations of things. And that's where it kind of all started. So you look at the First World War, that was huge. But you can go even further back uh, to uh, Sam Adams, great, great psyoper before psyop was a thing. So Sam, Ad Sam Adams had roughly 10 pen names that he wrote under, like fake pen names, okay. where he was uh, essentially the Alex Jones of his day. And mm. he just, like, wrote all these conspiracy theories about, like, the British and stuff. Um, and he helped to manufacture the American Revolution. So the more you read about the American Revolution, you kind of, like, see, like, oh, man. Like, did the people really care? Uh, or was it just, like, Sam Adams cared too much? And and everyone else, of course. <laughs> so, like, so, an Alex Jones that wasn't off the rocker. Oh, I wouldn't say that. I don't know. I don't want to comment on him because he's commented on the Cyop Regiment recently, and I don't want him to <laughs> to come at us like, harder. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you see, like that kind of activity is not new. Like Alex Jones is not unique to this time. It's just a normal human behavior, especially when you're talking about attempting to influence population. He just has a bigger platform and the means to influence more people than in the past. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of the internet, yeah. Mm -hmm. The way that information flows now is same, same, but not same. So, yeah, uh, when we talk about PSYOP and why it exists, it exists because of that propaganda ne needed to evolve as a social uh, response to the way governments were now functioning alongside the people. Mm -hmm. So governments were communicating to the people. We're in this weird, interesting uh, middle space now where that kind of still happens. But like you look at like presidential press releases and that kind of thing. But now we have uh, like a privatized media apparatus that acts on its own behalf and corporations kind of own that. 
And so it's not owned by the government. It's owned by like these interested parties on the side. And that, that's kind of, I think, what our, our country's dealing with. So you're with saying now. there's there's propagating information, but there's also pushing propaganda. Yeah, there's kind of like this post, post era of propaganda where we'll see. We'll see where, it, where it's going to evolve and how governments respond to it because governments are not technically in charge of all the stuff that the media says in in like a pure democracy or in like a country like ours where there's a free press. And so a lot of the stuff that uh, is labeled as what we would call PSYOP uh, in American discourse is actually just the journalists and the media and freelance and these like people on the periphery like Alex Jones and, and stuff like that. Those those interesting forms of expression where the people are so empowered that now they're at, at times dwarfing the government as it's attempting to communicate to them. And then the intent of psychological operations being applied out in theater or mm-hmm. just in competition or in integrated deterrence. Yeah. What's the purpose? Yeah. So at the end of the day, we're like Will and I, we're in the army. So we have to still have army solutions and we have to tackle army problems. The There's a lot of there's a lot that could be said about how much our military is applied to certain things. We look at dime, uh, diplomatic, information, military, and... Economic. There it is. Isn't there another thing in there? Too? Yeah, they added one more. T? That's dime. I just wrote a paper on this not too long ago. What is it? It's... We'll think about it in a minute. I'll okay. <laughs> there's, there's another letter on there. There's more letters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> the dime became a quarter, I guess. So when we look at dime, uh, often what that means for our government is military. And we'll try to squeeze everything else in if we can. So because we're applied to so many things, PSYOP is used as like an easy button at times for that. For that. So so we'll be applied to the humanitarian, humanitarian uh, situations where uh, in that case we are actually allowed to uh, what we would call influence Americans. But that's because we're only allowed to influence them by informing them. Okay. We can only say the government still exists and here's how to contact it. And here's how to get supplies and food and things that you need. So it's kind of it's kind of that very very uh, watered down version of influence where you're just communicating. So you're going kind of back to the roots of propaganda, a government communicating to its people. So you want to you want them to know, hey, if you're trapped somewhere, here's how you can get help. If you don't have food anymore, here's where food is. If you don't have power, here's these accesses to these public services. You're doing that kind of stuff. And, and so that's, I think, for most people, pretty easy for us to kind of come to terms with is I'm helping. But when you look at some of the more nebulous things, it's kind of getting into, like, the philosophy of war and just war and all those things. Uh, so I'm here to help you take out the bad guys. We define the bad guys in this scenario as terrorists. So I want to help them. But I want to help you, combatant commander, by getting the bad guys to pop their heads up so that you can then take them out or do whatever you want with them. I want them to probably talk more so that they can be uh, accessed by the intelligence community. Hell yeah. Uh, or I want to just take them out so I can trick them in some way into all consolidating into the same place, and then you just drop a bomb on them. You're doing things like that. So, so Chuck and I have talked about uh, uh, s- effects coordination cells or effects cells effects down cells, rounds. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we like to refer to things as soft effects. Mm-hmm. But how would you describe, you know, Chuck, and, you just, know, and this is like a new like? thing. Everybody yeah. thinks that this effect sells a new thing. If you just look at past doctrine, it's even for a special forces company, when you deploy and in, in a company as an, as an ODB deploys in the capacity of an advanced operating base, there's supposed to be a, a fairly robust effect cell. Mm-hmm. And this isn't new. I don't know why everybody thinks this, this is new, but... I mean, if you look all the way back into the early 90s, this was a thing. So I guess, Bobby, you want to talk about the nuances of an effect cell or all the different things that you can do with it or well, just what it is? I want to talk about what, what it is real quick because I, th- I think the information operations and psychological operations is a huge part of this. And I wanted to ask, you know, these two guys, um, you know, what, how, how do effects get synchronized across fires, civil affairs, PSYOP? Yeah. And information. Well, I, I have a vignette I think that might be easy for the audience to understand. In the southern Philippines, right, we had this foreign internal defense mission. Um, been there for like 20 years. I think, I think it closed down, what, 2016, 2017? OEFP? Um, OEFP. Operation right. Enduring Operation Freedom, Freedom Philippines. Operation Enduring Freedom for nice. Philippines, right. Uh, we had a joint special operations task force down there. 
Um, and a really common vignette is, you know, you have Mindanao, which is the, the, the joint operating area. So it's, it, it is in, it's contested, it's dangerous. Um, you have Abu Sayyaf Group and other trans-oceanic uh, terrorist organizations that move through these sort of unsecured island chains from the Philippines through Malaysia and, and onward. And um, one of the things you would see often, civil affairs teams would go in and they would do MedCAPs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget the actual. Medical civil affairs programs. Yeah. That's it, right? So the intent is, hey, we don't have access to this village. This village is of a, some strategic importance, right? Um, we need access to this. Okay, so civil affairs teams will, will run one of these medical events, right? The, the PSYOP teams will advertise those events and, and perhaps get people to show up. Maybe um, uh, in the Philippines, like print products are really popular, um, especially um, you know, before the, the age of the internet, um, huge banners, um, that sort of thing. So you know, th- they'll take the success of that event and then broadcast it throughout the region, right? And then what you start to see is you start to see fighters, right, who were, um, you know, conducting operations out there, start coming out of the wood line, coming out of the jungle, getting aid for their families and that kind of a thing. So now you have access to this area. Now the now the ODA can go in, and, and they're they're free to do what they needed to do in that in that space. Um, so we talk about sort of cross functional teams and, and hey, how do I how do I take PSYOP, CA, and SF, and how do they work together in a space to create effects? Yeah, that's yeah cool. and in the modern world you might have cyber guys in there you might have a right. public affairs officer and, and, a, and a jag in there for legal things to, to do whatever it is you got to because as we we're talking about earlier what is what effect are we trying to achieve to meet what in state mm-hmm. right you can also la- layer your effects so you might have more than one goal because you have more than one uh, organization involved you have more than one team making up a team of teams so you might have your pao your public affairs officer who's then going to do a press release to broadcast, like Will said, the effect, the effectiveness of what you just did so that then the media could be involved. Because you might actually, from doing that whole thing, if you're doing it right, uh, you might pull uh, the enemy off the battlefield so that we don't have to fight anyone because that's the goal, right, is peace. We want to get to a place where we're not actually fighting each other anymore. And so get, sometimes that's the effect that you want. Yeah, yeah. You never know. Exactly. Hey, real quick. I gave you 10 NCO points for knowing the definition of MedCap because it's pretty applicable. I thought that made sense. So, I've well, got, for you, we, we, we usually give officer and NCO points. If you make sense, uh, NCO points, if you're using a lot of acronyms or you're saying things that are just sound like you're trying to write an OER for yourself, you get officer points. So <laughs> Nice. Um, I like that scoring system. As a first group guy, super passionate and uh, have lots of time in the Philippines. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and saw that firsthand. And it was always uh, highly successful to reach the populace. Um, to to get to the fighters, provide civil services and uh, and you know, really uh, life sustainment type entities to the people there, uh, but also to gather information and mm-hmm. figure out what was truly right. going on and where people were or what was happening next. It, it, it's it's real basic stuff, right? Like uh, in the Philippines, you get typhoons that roll through there every year, right? And so it creates these huge humanitarian crises. And I want to say in 20, 2013 was a example of a hostage crisis. Yeah. So we had a, a double sort of a double entendre, right? Um, and the nearby, um, nice, <laughs> 10 points on the board for me. Um, so the, the, the nearby stadium was filled up with all these people who had, don't have, don't have homes anymore. Um, and so the CA teams are going in, we had doctors going in, they're doing water tests, right? Like the, the seals, the Navy seals on the, at the task force for building porta potties, uh, and then shipping them out there. Right. So it's like it, anytime we get kind of caught up in this word cloud of, of buzzwords, um, it's always a good reminder that it, it's it's just it's basic stuff at the end of the day. I wanted to ask I asked the same thing to uh, Rob McQueen in our Civil Affairs podcast, um, asking you guys this: Does anybody else out there, whether it's in the arsenal uh, throughout our military, or I guess the, uh, the 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 kind of State Department or government sector, do what you guys do? Mm. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, as an American citizen just driving down the street, right? Like the amount of of advertisements and curated things that are coming your way, it's like out of this world. You go to a restaurant, right? The music's been selected, the lighting has been selected, the floor is a certain way, the table is built a certain way. It's all to make you feel something, right? Like when you go there. Like giving people the example of Ikea. Have you ever gone to Ikea? Oh, perfect, yeah. I was getting lost in Ikea. Ikea intentionally sends you on the escalator to the second floor, so now it's more difficult to leave. Yes. And they send you through the maze. They want you to follow a path they don't want you to have free reign in their store. 
And yes, they they give you doors. You can go. You can always get off the path and leave really quickly. Uh, but they want you to go through that entire experience. It's like a, the line ride, right? And it, it caps off with a restaurant. And then you can go downstairs to the warehouse and be like gifted with the view of like, oh, Ikea has everything. Yes. So, yes. But like like Will's saying, there's, so there's food involved in Ikea. They're meatballs. Meat, meatballs, right? Oh, like yeah. the first thing you think of, right? Meatballs. Meatballs. Yeah. yeah. Where are they at? <laughs> and they're, like, they're music. I'm going to leave my cart right uh, here. There's also little parts of uh, influence that Ikea does that I really enjoy. Um all the books they have are in a foreign language, so no one's going to steal it. <laughs> mm, yeah. So that their books are right there. You can Brilliant. you can look at the book, but you can't. Most Americans aren't speaking that language, so they're just going like, ah, oh, I'll put it back. <laughs> like, but it's complete. It's not like stapled down or anything. Like, there's these little things. So so as as we're going into some campaigning, um, you know, and, and kind of the the thoughts of psychological operations applied in the modern construct. Uh, how do you guys approach measures of performances and measures of effectiveness, i.e., how, how do you know what's working and how do you know that what is happening and the, uh, the the outcome that you're getting is the one you want? 14 officer points for using mop and mow. Mop yeah. and mow. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, can you guys help us understand that? How do you articulate mm. that to the commander? That, of, could, that could be a whole podcast episode. To be yeah. honest, I'm going to – so cliff, therefore – Very short cliff notes. Yeah. Immediately throw it to Will to see if he has a shorter, a shorter way of explaining it. Okay. So – Let's see. We can use the Ghost in the Machine video as a as a case example. Let's do that because we were going to talk yeah. about the in depth next. Oh, well, it's a good segue. I mean, it, it's yeah, just it's a great an, so a recruiting. Um, it, it's it's a recruiting video, right? So, it, a measure of performance. Hey, we made a recruiting video. Hey, we we put it on ten websites, right? Hey, it was seen by ten thousand people, a million people. Um, the measure of effect, right, is the actual thing that you want to have happen, and it, typically it's some kind of indicator that you can measure. Like so clicks or views or so not even that duration so for measures us, of performance are clicks views right. things like that okay uh, even interactions with interaction that's that's the term we're talking about comments right? exactly but you want physical so, effects so for a recruiting video right how many people join up right how many people say hey I I want to I want to try this out right um, so for instance with SORB the Special Operations Recruiting Battalion we said hey let us know how many people will come by and say we saw this video and that's that's well, that was the impetus for me coming here, right? It's like 80 people right now. And I don't know if we can talk about recruiting numbers, but that's a very large segment of our recruiting mission for the fiscal year. Um, and it's already been met within, what, four weeks? Five uh, weeks? Yeah, it was within like six weeks, yeah. Um, that's impressive. Yeah, a, a buddy of mine impressive. at uh, West Point, um, he said he's a, he's a cyber, he's a, uh, he's a, a linguist, he speaks uh, Arabic, uh, he's a 3-3, three, three, he's a absolute weapon um but he said hey in the last two weeks i've had more people approach me to ask about psyop than the, in the last two years uh, that i've been here um so for me that, that's that's measure of performance that's a really good indicator that it's working or that it's provocative or people are talking about it but the actual effect that we want is we want people to come come join us you know want them to go to selection and, and come join our course so yeah we'll we'll get the actual measure of effectiveness from that video in roughly uh, the next year to three years to five and seven years, depending on the populations that have viewed it. So the West Point cadets who are freshmen, it's going to take them, what, seven to eight years before they would come into the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So those freshmen, we'll see. But the people who are down the street in the 82nd who want to come over, uh, you just have to walk down the street, guys, go to our dens. It's uh, the Special Operations Recruiting Battalion. You'll find it. Uh, those guys walking right in, that's a more uh, sooner flash to bang. Right. It, it, that's kind of, you know, um, so sometimes it's about swaying at 1% to 2% in one direction, right? It, those are always the hardest things to sell because it's more intangible and it takes years, you know, it takes years to happen. Yeah, that um, gets back to the last question of who else does this and, like, Everyone does this. Every like, if you come into PSYOP, you will have a job when you leave PSYOP. There's so many things. You can look at, uh, you guys ever go to Aldi? Aldi had this problem, right, where they want to make everything cheaper, less I, expensive. I know Chuck probably goes to Aldi pretty frequently. I go to Aldi. Aldi's awesome. I love it. So if you look at Walmart, Walmart's model of returning carts is to have someone do that full time. And they have cart machines, which cost hundreds if not thousands of dollars. And then people who are literally doing it as one of their one of their jobs, 
And so that's leading to back injuries. You almost always see them have back braces on and stuff. So then that's probably leading to workman's comp. There's all these it's additional all about funding. Too, yep. And yeah, for an organization like Walmart to not figure this out yet, I'm very surprised. Aldi's figured it out. They just put a quarter device where you have to put a quarter in the cart in order to access the cart. But you get your quarter back. And you, you get your quarter target. back. So there's mm-hmm. the financial incentive. I'd have to bring a quarter to Aldi to get the cart, and I have to, I want my quarter back. That's it. It costs you zero dollars as Aldi. You have the cost of the mach- the device on the cart, and so Aldi influences people to return the cart. So they also don't have in their parking lot cart returning kiosk, whatever you call those metal things that like you return the carts in. Or that you bang your car into accidentally somehow. Yeah, so that's exactly. like that's one example. But okay. then you can look at all sorts of things where, um, oh, I had another one. I had another one keyed up too. So like, I mean, look no further than our, I won't get too far into politics, but oh, that's politics perfect. is huge, right? Because it's it happens all the time. And it's, they're looking at 1% here, mm-hmm, 2%, exactly. like you said. Yeah. It, I mean, I've heard of stuff so conniving where it's like, hey, we, there's this one district in, say, Alabama, right? And we need to get the same we in the proverbial we. Um, after they do the, the analysis on the audience, they'll throw a concert in the, the county over or in the state over to get those people who would vote in that direction to go to that concert instead of being there on the voting day. Mm. So there's, it, it gets Machiavellian in, in the truest sense. Um, yeah, so but, you can apply these things to anything. The yeah. music industry uses it. The film industry uses it. Um, it's a rabbit hole to look at let's, let's, how you apply influence in the civilian world yeah. as a civilian. I should say, right. as a civilian, as, yes, exactly, you don't yeah. do it to Americans. Yeah. Uh, Let's we ta- do it to foreigners, yeah, uh, f- not foreigners, foreign populations <laughs> with Sounds awful our too. partner with our partner forces. So it's not all. We also aren't doing this unilaterally. We're being invited by these countries to help them with complicated problems like narco terrorism and human smuggling, things like that. That's what we're being applied to. Right. I'd like to ask a little bit more. So uh, kind of hopping back to Ghost in the Machine. Yeah, I want to. I want to get the details of that. Yeah, well, it's. It's Expand upon that a lot if you of could, Jens. Controversy, right? Yeah, sparked some controversy. Mm. It's um, a lot, lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. I think that we've we've seen uh, going up. You guys probably heard about. Uh, what would be some of the words you would use to capture the message in that, mm-hmm. and some of the intangibles that Ooh. you feel well, through? Well, the intangibles. Uh, it's the hard so part. I actually don't want to talk too much about the intangibles. To the well, here's what I want to say. Um, when it comes to that video, understanding that video, the point is that it does not define everything because it wants the intent of that video is for the audience to define things for themselves. Ooh. So when you're talking about things like deception or even normal psyop or any of that, where we're talking about influencing a, a, a population, you can look at something like horror, right? So in the horror genre, the scariest thing in the horror genre is describing something but not describing it too much. You not want showing the reader it. Not showing yeah. you want the reader to fill oh, in the yeah. blanks because anything they think of is scarier. Think of any horror movie where like, like Super Eight where like everyone complained because they saw the monster at the end. They're like, oh it was dumb. Mm-hmm. But every part before that moment was great. And so like, like oh don't show the monster. Like you can think of this all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, so Spielberg's Jaws, right? Um, perfect. throughout most of the runtime of that film you never see the shark. Yep. Um, and I think there was actually, if, if you dig into technical it, there, difficulties. there's actually technical difficulties with it, right? So yeah. they had these constraints. And so they're like, hey, how do we use the medium of film and sound to create fear in the audience without showing them the actual thing? So it actually became sort of a, 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 a problem statement for us on the outreach team was, hey, don't show the shark. So how, how, do, we, how do we sell Sia without showing the shark? How do we, how do we convey what it feels like, mm-hmm. right? Um, versus putting a guy in, in a... If you look at most cyber recruiting videos in the past, it's it's literal. It's a guy in a suit pointing at things. It's an embassy, right? Ah, this is what we do. This is what we are. Not necessarily what it feels what like. It feels like yeah. Because there's also, so we're always limited in our recruiting because the coolest stuff that we do is classified and will be classified. Um, so we didn't really properly introduce ourselves. But uh, so my name's Ashley and in my free time, I'm a writer. And I, I write books, I do satire, uh, I love creating things, I'm a graphic artist. My best work is classified, my best work. And it's gonna be that way until like I'm 50 years from now, I'll be dead probably. So it's like no one will know until then. <laughs> but but that's like also some of the most uh, difficult stuff is when we talk about this in like a public forum or for recruiting, we can't show anyone 
the cool stuff. We have to talk about Desert Storm and mm. leaflets, and we have to talk about World War II and signals intelligence from the 1940s, but we can't talk about what we do now. And so that's that's the difficult thing, is that balance. Right. So narratively in the video, right, what we purposely do is we leave out the whole middle section of what PSYOP is, right? It, it's not that we're going out there and creating revolutions or undermining social movement. That's not That's not it, right? That represents the greatest possible outcome of unconventional warfare or irregular warfare, right? Um, so by not showing that middle part, you leave it to the audience. And that's why I think it's so incendiary and provocative is because people will have different interpretations of what that is, right? So there's there's this interesting aspect of human behavior, right? So this is getting into some uh, biology. So the marriage of the sciences and the arts, right? People believe what they want to believe, and they see what they want to believe because we make decisions based off of our limbic system. So we have this massive cerebral cortex, and that's all the logical brain. That thing does not make decisions for us. Our tiny little microscopic, not microscopic, but it's very small limbic <laughs> system, where all of our emotions are, that's where we make decisions. So we make decisions based off of how things make us feel. So if I like X, Y, or Z, I'm gonna be more apt to believe it. That's why movie stars are in TV commercials, because I think Hugh Jackman makes me feel good. So he sells me orange juice in Korea. You know, like this random, <laughs> this yep. random stuff. It's because we like them. We don't even know who they are as people because everything is manufactured that they participate in. Everything that they say is is being given to them by PR representatives. And all of their lines are written by people who are actually professional writers in their films. But you look on social media and this movie star is quoted all the time, but that's a quote that they just read in front of a teleprompter. It's, this, it's fascinating, right? Once we start to look, look at the details of this. But because that person makes me feel good, I'm going to believe them. This is the same thing. This this video makes me feel strange. So now I'm unsettled. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm going to reach whatever conclusion I want to reach. So while yes, there was a lot of traction and it did go what we would call viral, uh, and conspiracy theorists have loved. There's loved, people online loved. correlating it to UFOs and aliens. Oh, perfect. So, That's amazing. Go one deeper. Um, yeah. <laughs> Give it to us. So much more complicated than that. Um, but beyond that, uh, <laughs> Was the that's not our audience. Real? That's not our audience. <laughs> but that's okay that they're participating and enjoying whatever whatever it is that they're enjoying. Uh, and they're latching onto it and trying to make videos about it and all this other stuff. But the, the people who are our audience are now more apt to actually see it. So because Alex Jones made a video about this, he helped to make it go more viral. The irony of him making a video that was actually kind of critical of this is that critical video is now seen by more people who are our actual audience. Alex Jones was never our audience, but now he has shown it to our audience more. It's this crazy... It's the Streisand effect, right? Exactly, exactly. More. yeah. It's exactly Love the effect. Streisand effect. So this is also... This is, this is our ability... You. This is, a, this is an opportunity to kind of brag about effects too, right? and stuff here. <laughs> What's that? Are we giving out points for everybody knowing what the Streisand effect is, except for Bobby? You don't know what it is? No. Oh, uh, you can observe. Barbara parade. Streisand, it was like 10, 15 years ago. Uh, at one point, an image of her beach house was put on the internet. And she did not like that an image, like the location and image of her house was on the internet. So she, through some, like a, an agent or whatever, like a, a professional means, attempted to get it removed from the internet which then went viral and went viral in the wrong way. So now there's a lot of images of her house on the internet. And so <laughs> it brings exactly. more, so something you want to suppress something, but then it has the adverse effect of bringing a lot more attention to it. Impact fired. The yeah. exact opposite of her intent has occurred. Massive. So I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, I wanted to ask you guys as individuals who you plan for the best case outcome or scenario or the effect you're trying to get, just like in, um, in uh, with Ghost in the Machine, um, but as psychological operations individuals, you can't control what that outcome is going to be, right? Yeah. So kind of like that toothpaste scenario of like once it's out, you can't put it back in. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you advise people or how do you at least talk about that of you're going to get an outcome. We're trying to push in the right direction, but it may not be that. And you know, how, how do you guys talk about that's, that? That's, that's a real challenge, right, is that yeah, the video is on YouTube. Anybody can see it, right? Um, and I think there's this tendency um, – I won't, there's a tendency for um, people to be very risk averse when it comes to information or videos or whatever, right? And I think what this has shown is that it's okay. 
Yeah, it, it's it's okay. Um, there have been, I'm not sure how far I can go here, but there's been uh, conversations happening at a very, very high level of government, um, back and forth between our senior leaders in, in Washington. And uh, really interesting because it's, it's yeah, created about the video. Yeah, about the video. It's created this uh, this conversation that didn't exist before. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, one of the things that with the video, the video is what it is. But what I want in the audience to see in that is a potential future cyber. They watch that and they know what it is. Oh, it's it's idealism. It's mystique. It's using the medium of film and film trailers to. Oh, I, oh, I feel a certain way at the end of this. That's cool. How, how did I how did I feel that way? How did it make How did it get me to that point? So the person that wants to deconstruct that is the kind of person we're looking for, mm. right? Yeah, I feel inspired. Why? You don't right. want just the person who feels inspired. You want the person who then takes the next step. And opens it up and looks at all the parts and how does this machine work, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, the ghosts in the machine, I'm looking at your T-shirt, right? That that specific oh, yeah. thing. Or art piece of artwork is in the video, if I'm not mistaken. And I've seen right. those stickers Simple. everywhere too. Yeah. Yeah. Has that yes. has that just been around forever? Is that the Ghost Army? There were um, I don't remember the artist's name. So uh, the Ghost Army had so many artists that they created um, entire books worth of content just in their free time when they were like in the middle of this war. And uh, this was one of the symbols that they made is the ghost with three lightning bolts. And the bolts. symbol, if you can, if you, nobody can see it, but it's a ghost with the lightning bolts coming out mm-hmm. of his hand. Yep, it's a white ghost, um, and he has the three lightning bolts in his hand. So it, you see it everywhere. <clears throat> it, it's everywhere. And what's cool is that it, it's, it's a sort of identity of the ghost, right? Um, you look at, like, ODAs, right? Like, the team identity the ODA, of the ODA is so... It's such its own thing that guys will get will get the logo tattooed on them mm-hmm. themselves, right? We just talked about this the other day. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, right? Like, and you don't it's, just it's go in there. Built into the culture of that specific team. The Marine Corps. Exactly. Have you ever met a Marine without the <laughs> Marine Corps tattoo? Exactly. It, you don't just go on that team and change the logo, right? It, it is what it is. So what's cool with Psyop is that we is sort of everyone has taken sort of the idea of a ghost and they've created their own identity out of that. Um, so you look at slap stickers, this sort of things. It's cool to see all of the the variations of that ghost that started with the ghost army, and where you know where all it ends up. Yeah, mm-hmm. Remixes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We, There's we, uh, which so that at the end of the Ghost of the Machine video, so one of the versions iterations of the ghost you'll see as a remix is uh, the the short clip that was actually at the end of the Ghost of the Machine video, which is actually uh, from a old Betty Boop cartoon. A lot of we, we saw all sorts of comments on the Ghost of the Machine video where people were like, oh, look at this ghost. It's so unfair. Like, they very clearly have not seen old black and white Betty Boop cartoons because <laughs> they right. don't know where that image is. It's like 15 frames per second. It's like an unsettling filmic kind of yeah. Yeah. Uh, ethereal. I don't know. It's unsettling. So back <laughs> last summer, right, a former NCO of mine would say, hey, look at this ghost. This is what I use in my presentations. And, and I looked at that and I was like, oh, geez, like, I don't like that at all. That's unsettling. I don't like the way he's bending over. His legs are too long. Like, this doesn't make it, – it's weird. And so when we went back and we looked at the original video, there's this moment where a witch sort of – and there's this clown that's dancing. The old Betty Boop cartoon. Exactly. Which yeah. is unsettling in itself, right? Clowns are creepy. Yeah. I, so yeah. creepy. <laughs> so creepy. So the clown's dancing, and the witch reveals the clown to be a ghost, right? And so when you look at – Ghost in the Machine as this sort of philosophical, philosophical idea of uh, you know yin and yang, man and machine, uh, the the body and the mind. Um, the idea that this uh, this clown is being revealed to be a ghost is a really interesting sort of dualism and what you know light and darkness, you know deception and truth, uh, a clown and a ghost. And so that was kind of. Uh, um, that was really the, the inspiration point. Um, I mean, I'm seriously having anxiety just thinking about a clown right now. Just thinking about the videos. It is so super creepy. It's weird. I wanted to ask you, so you just hit light and dark, um, truth and deception. Can you tell us about the history of the Flash that I have here on my beret Ooh. of the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School, which you'll see it on our logo if you look at our websites or anything like that. But uh, essentially the background is uh, – uh, you have the black portion, the white portion, the gray portion, right. and the gold, um, the Asian gold uh, outline. But do you guys know the history of the three colors? Yeah, so um, back in the day, this was not called uh, USA JFK SWIC. It was called the special, uh, it was called the Psychological Warfare Center. And that's actually where 
Psy War started, and then that's where Special Forces grew out of. So I'm not going to go into all the details and then like try to play that like who came first because we did and it's recognized by the Yusak historian but, 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 but whatever but back to the colors though <laughs> the colors are white uh, gray and black psyop so what we call vanilla psyop the humanitarian stuff everything the overt 100% truth uh, you have to then gray psyop where it's uh, 99% truth and you're, and you're adding more of the influence that kind of the more uh, who is the originator of this information where is this coming from? What is the intent? Uh, more obfuscated. At then, attribution or uh, non-attributable. Well, that's black psyop. Okay. Where we call it clandestine operations. Where, Cut that portion out. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's black psyop where you're not uh, saying who derived it. It's not going to be usually attributed to the United States, usually with our partners that we're working with because we want to prop them up and support them. And it's fascinating for, for any of our cadre or uh, listeners if they're not as familiar with, you know, we worked that on our berets right now. So thanks, oh, yeah. for, thanks for the history lesson. And, That's and really good. And even seeing the SWIC, uh, the horse symbol, like that, the horse in the SWIC symbol is a, the PSYOP horse. And that's what that's referencing is it references two things, right? The Trojan horse for one, one of the greatest military deceptions of all time. Whether or not it happened, doesn't matter. We take it. And then uh, also a chess piece, which. Oh, yeah. More the nerdier part, but Will, you were also going to say uh, the the psi symbol. So if you look at the original design from the heraldry office, the kettle that we have uh, is supposed to have a psi, uh, like the Greek Latin symbol, the psi, in the middle of it. And so that's also something that if you look at our, if the origin of even that symbol is also uh, a psi symbol. That's what the kettle is, is it's the kettle is actually surrounding. It's in the shape of a psi. Pretty, pretty fascinating. But it's not, a, it just wasn't something that was added to the... the Over time, the Psy symbol was taken out. Gotcha. So this is one of those things where, like, we kind of take Psy up out of the history of soft sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and by we, I mean just other soft organizations inside soft, you know? They, like, uh, they don't want to put it on their Wikipedia pages that, like, and we were stood up here out of nothing. <laughs> yeah, we're just out of nothing. Uh, so you even have one of the SF groups has the... The Trojan horse still as their symbol. Yeah, 10th Special Forces mm -hmm. group primarily. Mm -hmm. All right, what does a PSYOP team look like? What is, what's the construct of a PSYOP team? We've talked about a civil affairs team with Rob McQueen. We talked about the uh, Special Forces ODA. Can you guys just hit on that real quick? What does a PSYOP team look like? So this is interesting because uh, it's changing or is in the, the process of changing. Uh, it used to be, um, it, in my experiences, right, it was typically... I had a, had a detachment, right, which was uh, eight to ten folks, and then we would be piecemealed out uh, for missions, right. So it's very, it was very common to be in a two-man team at an embassy in, say, Bangladesh or in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and so what we've moved away from is that sort of piecemealing of the unit of action, and we've moved to what's called a psychological operations detachment, so a side debt. Um, and it's it's a twelve-man team, right? Which sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, and so that is now the unit of action. So that team will deploy, and then they potentially could split up, right, to cover operations, at least from a regional perspective. Mm -hmm. If you're supporting a, um, a, a U.S. embassy or a global combat commander, my experience has usually been when I'm working with a special forces guy, it's the first time they've ever met one of mm -hmm. one of us in the field. And so there's always kind of that conversation that you have to start of like, yeah. here's what I do. Here's my understanding of how I can help you. And then you kind of go back and forth so that they can understand, like, I'm not just the leaflet guy. And yeah. especially when it comes to special forces and working with, uh, like, Navy SEALs or mm -hmm. a Ranger, like, I need to make sure they understand that, like, hey, I can do that, but let's talk yeah. about what you want to do and what your mission is. And, and let's go in that direction. I'm not trying to take us in yeah. another direction. I mean, it's always like, hey, you get the psychological operation, but like, what can we do, but... Especially just for the commander, advise us on where the legalities are. Like what, mm -hmm. like what's the limit of what we can do, and that we can't do. The partner force might be able to do it, but keep us out of trouble here, mm -hmm. right? And then that's like, okay, we can do all this. That sounds great, but we can't quite do this. And that's where the jag always comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Is you want to make sure your lawyer is tied in with all of those conversations, so that uh, we're following the laws of armed conflict and all these mm -hmm. other things. The way the way influence works is it, it can very quickly. 
go off the rails into very high levels of approval processes mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to just authorities and stuff like that. And then you sign up yourselves because the hire is like, wait a minute, you guys are doing this illegally. You no, know, we're not doing that. We were just making it seem like we were doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we were yes. pretending to fake. Yeah, because that, that's happened before. Like That didn't actually happen. We were just playing the games down here. And my, my favorite uh, moment as a cyber has always been when the intelligence section of whatever organization I'm working with has to approach me and ask me if this is real. <laughs> yep, there you go. Yes. Well, is, this, is this real or is this you? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the billboard. Remember your billboard analogy? So here's a hypothetical that we sometimes bring up to our students so they can understand some of the concepts of nesting a psy what we call like a psyop within a psyop. Okay. Where you're layering your effects and you have an overt effect where There's layered soft effects. Exactly. So if we were if we were talking about white, gray, and black, which is no longer in our doctrine, but we still kind of reference it sometimes. Uh, uh, versions of psyop, and you wanted to do all three at the same time, you could. So let's say, let's transport ourselves back to 2005 uh, Iraq. The insurgency is a thing and we're there and we're trying to figure out how we're going to tackle this problem. So if I was in 2005 Iraq and I suddenly put up a billboard with an American flag on it and said, we're here to help you, uh, what would happen to that billboard? Probably get destroyed, right? Yeah, because one, it's tone deaf, two, it's what's it really trying to accomplish, whatever. Like this very like hearts and minds, overt, vanilla, but again, tone deaf billboard. What and if, how many people can actually read that too? Yeah, who knows? Like it could, who cares, you know? Yeah. But they know what the American flag is by now. So it's gonna probably get destroyed, but what if that's not the point? What if I know it's gonna get destroyed? What if I have an infantry buddy of mine who's always going out on patrol and I can say like, hey, tell me how long this thing lasts. And he goes out every day and he comes back and he goes out the first day and comes back and says like, hey, man, your billboard's already gone. Heck, yeah. Now I know it lasts a day. So now I can put 10 of these things out. Boom. 10 American flag. We're here to save you billboards. Let's do this together, you guys. We're going to stop this, and we're helping you, and all these lo all these things that aren't really happening right, because they can just look around them and say, like, that's wrong, and they're going to have an emotional, visceral reaction to this billboard, and they're probably going to destroy it. Well, spoiler alert, no one destroys a billboard from two miles away. They're right there. And this is war, right? This is conflict. So we're the landowner, which means we have intelligence assets like UAVs, and we can soak those 10 billboards. And I can follow that person home that just destroyed my billboard. And when I go to their place, and I see where they go, and I find out about them, we can use other intel and determine whether or not this is just some angry kid, some terrorist, or something else. If it is a terrorist, though, we can then continue to follow him and when that terrorist cell is destroyed, they will never know it was because of my crappy billboard. No one will know. In fact, everyone on the FOB that isn't us, that's not read into this, is going to go, oh, PSYOP, yeah, they make American flag billboards and stuff. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them not even understanding what I'm doing. I'm very much okay with them not realizing that, like, I'm playing 4D chess when they think I'm playing, like, you know, Scrabble over here in the corner, you know. All right, guys, we've had a pretty awesome discussion today. Some incredible themes along the line of psychological operations, some historical vignettes, some application in the modern realm of the information domain and really the competition and integrated deterrence and how you guys fit together. Um, any closing comments from, uh, from Will and Ashley? Anything you guys want to leave our listeners with? When I'm talking to someone who's thinking about coming over, I always make sure that I, I ask them what, they, what they're looking for. Yeah. Uh, so... I have mentored more than one person into special forces. I've mentored more than one person into CA because they frankly uh, were more fit for those roles. And so hopefully the goal of this podcast is, is so that special forces and CA folks and, and anyone else better understands what PSYOP kind of is and what, what our goals are so that they can mentor people into this direction. 
Are you a super nerd? Uh, are you a computer nerd? Uh, we got a place for you. Are you an artist? We got a place for you. Are you into the sciences and you want to apply your degree and you know uh, all this crazy stuff about like survey methodology or statistics or even mathematics and you're, you want to think, uh, is there a place for me in the army? Like, yes, 100%. And it's with us. Like, we got a place for you. There's all kinds of stuff. Did you, are you a DJ in your free time like Will is? Or, or a wedding photographer or videographer like Will is? So heck yeah, come over, come to the dark side. We got a place for you and we're very willing to put you to work. Yes, because at the end of the day, it's about storytelling, uh -huh. right? How do you tell that story? It can, the, the medium doesn't matter. It's, are you a storyteller? And if you are, then. Yeah, and do, and do you want to be creative? So when, when I was in school, I was into the arts and I was doing videos in my free time all the time. I was wasting a lot of time doing that, and I was a sociology major, which I majored in sociology, assuming that I would never apply it, ever, ever, ever. I just liked it because it was interesting to me. I found out that the Army does have a place for that. They have, it does have a place for someone who majors in sociology and makes videos in their free time. There's, uh, it's called PSYOP, and we're always looking for more, and, and it could be anyone. Just like we said at the beginning, like, there is no such thing as the perfect psyoper. We, if you look at one of us, that's it. You've met one. Uh, every single one of us is different, and we're an entire regiment of individuals. And that individuality is what makes the psyop regiment the psyop regiment. Hell yeah! But you still get to jump out of airplanes and go across the globe, and that's right. Work oh, yeah. with other incredible people too. Chuck, over to you, man. Any closing comments? No. Nah, thank you guys for coming on the show, and I want to know about the video and just all the stuff within it and talking about psychological operations throughout history. So it's been awesome for me and you know, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff. Heck yeah. So well, appreciate I appreciate it. the time and yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Ashley thanks. Holtzman and Will Lamb. Thanks for being on Pineland Underground. We'll see you all next time. What does a sprinter eat for food? Nothing. They fast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's wow. Funny. That's amazing. Thanks for joining us today in Pineland Underground, the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and Schools official podcast. Please tune in to our next episode. We release episodes every two weeks. You can reach us at pinelandunderground at gmail.com. Check it out.